Hey, everybody. Welcome to Hope Unabridged. I'm Angie Elkin. And I'm Casey Brennan. We are so excited you're here today. We are having a conversation about toxic people and toxic relationships, (laughs) toxic situations, anything toxic. We're talking about it today. And we have an expert on the show, Gary Thomas. We're excited for you to meet him. And we're excited for this conversation. I'm so excited. (laughs) Yeah. We found ourselves in a few toxic relationships and situations in our lives. I think we all have. (laughs) Yeah, it is. I mean, there are so many toxic. I think it's interesting too, and I'm interested to hear Gary's perspective, but I think sometimes we find ourselves in places that are even toxic and we don't even realize it. Yeah, we don't. It's it's like that analogy, the the frog boiling in the water, yes, right? It's, exactly. It's like that. that. Um, what I'm really interested to hear from him is his take on the biblical perspective mm-hmm. and how Jesus handled relationships that might have been toxic yeah. or situations. And so I think that as Christians, we often feel that we should stick it out mm-hmm. and, and stay committed even when the relationship is hurtful. Right. Um, but Gary is going to kind of open our eyes today. Yeah. To a, a different way. So mm-hmm. Gary Thomas is here today. He is the author of over 20 books. He's a speaker. He is writer in residence at Second Baptist Houston. He's been married for 35 years. He is the father of three kids and one grandchild. Welcome, Gary Thomas. We're so glad you're here. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. So this topic of toxic people, it's really grabbed my attention. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it's one of those things that people think, oh, First of all, am I in a toxic relationship? I need to know. So tell us, how do we know if we found ourselves in a toxic relationship? How do we know? <laughs> it's interesting what you said before about sometimes the the frog in the, the water that gradually gets mm-hmm. heated up. Yeah. Uh, I I love to read different sports biographies. Alberto Salazar is one of our nation's most successful marathoners ever. And he, he got really sick. He really injured his mm-hmm. kidneys during a long, hot run. And he went through years of just not mm. feeling well. And he said something that I'll never forget. He goes, I didn't realize how badly I felt until I started feeling better. Mm. And I think that's it for toxic people. Mm-hmm. They get so used to just being drugged down and yeah. cr- the craziness of it, the discouragement of it, the futility Really one of the best ways to describe it is it's a relationship that's slowly destroying you. Mm -hmm. It might be your peace. It might be your joy. It might be your self-confidence. It's a kind of relationship that sort of haunts you and distracts you from healthy relationships. So at night, when you want to be free with your friends or a spouse or kids, you can't get the person out of your mind or Mm -hmm. you wake up and you're replaying a conversation and then it's hard to get back to sleep. So they're stealing your sleep. You see their name come up on your phone or the email address and immediately your blood pressure spikes. Yeah. Okay. You know, you're in a situation where somebody is really pulling you down. Um, and, and, and some might say, well, it seems selfish as a Christian to worry about somebody stealing my joy, mm. except for the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Mm-hmm. Strength. And if somebody destroys your self-confidence, what that means is you're not going to speak up with someone else. You're not going to mm. try to help them. You can think, I'm crazy. I'm losing my mind. I don't know what's true. I don't know what isn't. I don't have anything to give to anybody. And so if somebody destroys you, Mm. they destroy the avenue through which God could use you. So they're not just destroying you. They're destroying your future ministry. So it's not wrong or selfish to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. It's a godly thing to protect yourself because you're the vehicle through which God pours out his blessing to so many other people. Mm, That's that. so good. So how do we know if a person is toxic? I know you give us in your book, How to Walk Away, um, some examples of a, a toxic person. So tell us, like, I, we've all got a person in our mind right now. Yeah. You know, we're already there. How yeah. do we know for sure that person qualifies as toxic? Yeah, well, every toxic person is difficult, but not every difficult person is toxic. Okay. Mm. okay. There's a difference. Just because somebody bugs us or disagrees with us or even is forceful doesn't make them toxic. I tend to have more of a gentle demeanor. I'm a third born. I'm not a type A personality. I'm not the the alpha dog attack person. And so it'd be easy for me with sort of that demeanor to think of a forceful person as toxic because they're different than me. That That's that's not fair. Yeah. Um, 
toxic people, first I would say it's that bit we said before about they're destroying you a little bit. And then there are three markers. Now, you don't have to have all of these markers, but I found they're often present. The first, mm -hmm. toxic people tend to be controlling. Mm -hmm. They are determined you will do what they want you to do. Mm -hmm. uh, they might present themselves as needy. You're the only one that can help me. Mm -hmm. They might present themselves as threatening. If you don't do this, I'll make your life uh, horrible. Uh, they might say, if you don't do this, someone else's, they might recruit others, gossip to bring in others, but they're just determined that they will get you to do what they want you to do. And mm -hmm. spiritually, we know this is the opposite of how God operates, yeah. which, which is amazing to me because God is always right. Mm -hmm. And he always wants our best. So if he controlled us in one sense, you'd say we might be better off, but God doesn't operate that way. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Yeah. God presents the truth. And the Bible is a picture of God letting people face the consequences, mm -hmm. but not controlling them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's Satan who controls. In fact, in the New Testament, while there's demonic possession, there's no God possession. Mm -hmm. We're filled with the Holy Spirit, but Paul says the spirit of the prophets is subject to the control of the prophets. So God persuades and leaves it up to us. Um, control is more of a demonic act. It's not what mm -hmm. God wants us to do. It's saying to somebody, I don't want you to follow what your conscience says or what you think God is leading you to do. You're going to do what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. a, a second dangerous marker is they have a murderous spirit. Yeah. Now, I, I know that sounds hyperbolic, but let me explain. <laughs> If you look at somebody's life and they blow apart small groups because they create mm -hmm. division, yeah. they blow apart office environments where it's just more tense when they're there because mm -hmm. they're undercutting, they're gossiping. Mm -hmm. They just, they murder your joy, your peace, your sanity, family gatherings, your reputation. Mm -hmm. They just like to destroy. And again, that's the opposite of God. God created life. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, Satan comes to steal, to kill mm -hmm. and to destroy. Yeah. But I have come that you can have life and life abundantly. So somebody's bringing life. They're being inspired by God. If they bring death everywhere they go, mm -hmm. when they get thrilled about that, that's just a toxic personality. Yeah. Instead of building people up, they get a sick satisfaction out tearing people down. The third thing I like to say is that they love to hate. Mm -hmm. Paul has a great list in Colossians 3 about things that we take off and things that we put on. What we take off, he says, should be anger, rage, malice, mm. slander, filthy language, and lying. Mm -hmm. And the things that we put on should be compassion, kindness, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I read that list, and often healthy people say, well, sometimes I act out of anger. Sometimes I have malice. Sometimes I might even slander. Here's the difference. For a toxic person, they're at their best when they're doing their worst. Mm. Oh, wow. Be, being involved in a fight makes them excited. It gets their adrenaline going. A healthy mm. person, we don't go to the office hoping for a fight. We don't <laughs> go home to our spouse hoping that we can get into it with our spouse. We want to encourage people. We want to support each other. Mm -hmm. But toxic people are bored with a healthy marriage. Mm -hmm. they're, they're bored with a peaceful office environment. Uh, they're bored uh, at a retirement center where everybody's getting along. They want to <laughs> have the intrigue and get people to gossip and whatnot. And that's, mm. and that's the difference. It's possible to act in a toxic way now and then without being a toxic person. Mm -hmm. The difference is for a toxic person, acting in a toxic way energizes them. It yeah. gets them excited. It makes them feel like they're alive. For a healthy person, if they see themselves acting in that way and they're convicted of it, they go, oh, I don't, I don't want to be like that. I want to take a spiritual shower. I want to take those dirty clothes off. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Can, I love that illustration. Can you talk about like, because I, when, when I hear the descriptions that you just said, it makes me think of like an aggressive type, personality type. You know what I mean? Like somebody that's, but, yeah. but there are also toxic people that are not aggressive and yeah. that are kind of like silent destroyers. Can you talk about yes. yeah. that a little? Well, they they can present themselves as needy. Mm, uh, you're the only one that can help me. One of the mm. illustrations I used was a woman who was at a workplace where a woman knew that this other woman was a Christian. And so she just kept pouring out her, 
her needs and asking for counsel. And as a Christian, the woman's like, okay, I want to help you. And, yeah. But then it just got to be too much. And the mm. woman became so demanding. She would send her like seven page single spaced emails. <gasps> and if she didn't respond wow. in an hour, wow. it was like, what? you don't care what's wrong with you. Or she would leave these long messages until the phone cut them off. And until finally this woman just said, I, I'm sorry, from now on, I, I can't do the work I've been hired to do. We're going to keep our relationship professional. We can't mm -hmm. talk about personal things at work. Well, that's that's a not only a legitimate thing to say, that's a healthy thing to yeah. say in an office environment. You're hired to do work, not to be a counselor to coworkers. Mm -hmm. Well, this needy person, she wouldn't accept that she was going to control her time, not in an aggressive way, but a needy way. So she went to other women in the office and said, I'll just use Carol. I thought Carol said she was a Christian. Mm. I've asked her for help. Yeah. She won't help me. She's cut me off. Yeah. You know, all of that, th those were lies. Carol was very clear about what was going on. Mm. She was acting in a responsible way. But that woman was using neediness to try mm -hmm. to control mm. and be toxic. So it, it can be both. Yeah. Yeah. I can see even a passive aggressive behavior mm -hmm can also be controlling, you know, and that's one of those things that's a little bit hard to recognize because usually the passive aggressive people are a little more quiet mm -hmm. and um, to think of them as controlling can be hard. So, yeah. yeah. Do you have <laughs> there, any there examples this, uh, of that? Yeah. Well, this is, this was years ago and I don't know if any of your uh, viewers will remember it, but there was a sitcom called Malcolm in the Middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's the youngest son, and I don't even remember his name. It's been so long. But it was a hilarious episode because he went through the neighborhood and he turned everybody against each other. Mm -hmm. Why does he always get his way? Or why do you guys always do what he wants to do? Or why do you always get the best chair? Or, and and also said, yeah, why? Do, and it was just, it was this ingenious, he would just ask a question mm -hmm. and he got all these people fighting against each other. And that's mm -hmm. sort of the passive aggressive way where you can just say, y you notice why you always, you're the one that always gives. And, and it, it's, it, it was humorous, but it made the point yeah. that you don't have to be forceful. The point is, are you breathing life into other relationships? Or are you bringing division? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to bring people together or pull them apart? Do you get more joy laughing as a group and encouraging and blessing someone or being the person in the middle who's pitting two against mm -hmm. each other and you, you know their secrets and you're holding them hostage and, and making them angrier so that they'll both feel beholden to you? I mean, that's, that's just yeah. flat out evil. Yeah. 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 That's what happens when you find yourself in a place? Like, can a, can a place be toxic because of the place or can it be, yeah. is it because of a person? Like, can you talk about that and the difference? Yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've often said, and I, I always encourage CEOs, whether it's a nonprofit organization or a business or just anywhere where you have authority that because toxic people murder, if you don't deal with them, one of the things get, that gets murdered is your job because <laughs> mm. they usually make the office environment so chaotic yeah. that eventually people are going to hold the boss accountable. And so if you want to yeah. just be the nice guy that isn't willing to confront the toxic person under you, uh, eventually that toxic person is going to get you yeah. for that because that's, mm -hmm. that's just what they do. I think yeah. it really depends on your situation. I have a story in the book, When to Walk Away, about a professional golfer mm -hmm. with another golfer. We called him Golfer X, who was just <laughs> so talk. He was so mean to the fans and the mm -hmm. officials yeah. and everybody. And, and most of these officials at golf tournaments volunteer their time. Mm -hmm. They're just thrilled to be around the professional. Yeah. And he was just acting like a jerk. And this other golfer is a friend of mine, just a solid guy, just really confronted him and said, hey, you, you can't treat people like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it got the other golfer so mad, he hit the next ball out of bounds. Which <laughs> <laughs> made, but, and they had this icy thing. But it was, I think, an appropriate, I would say, a Christian thing to do mm -hmm. to defend others because everybody's going to give way to the golf professionals. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're right. sort of up here. And yeah. so it, he needed one of his peers. If you're not in authority or even on par, sometimes you just got to walk away like this woman said, you know what? Our conversations need to be professional. Mm 
I, I don't have what you need from me. I'm not a professional counselor. And, and you're just sort of walking away by setting boundaries. Can we talk a minute about just toxicity in a place of worship? Because I see so often, you know, there's toxic culture or something will happen and people leave and then they don't just leave the, the church or the place of worship. They like, they don't go back to church. Can we talk about that? Cause that's a really big thing. Yeah. Well, I think one, we have to be really careful in the church context about control. Mm-hmm. Uh, s- self-righteous control can be the worst. Oh, wow. And look, as a, as a writer and a blogger and a speaker, I know that some people are going to disagree with me and some people might say, I I just don't like the take of this book. I don't like the message of this book or whatnot. I think where it becomes toxic control is if you're saying, not only do I not like it, I don't want anybody to read it. And I'm going to do a campaign. Nobody at (laughs) at that point, you're starting to say, what, what, what? Yeah. Um, You don't want somebody else to interact with it. And but it could also be a, a pastor that won't let any part of a sermon be questioned. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be um, somebody that their little fiefdom, their little mm-hmm. kingdom is the Bible study. And yeah. they're going to determine who teaches and what's taught mm-hmm. and, and what not. I mean, you, you just I, I just think in church circles, which I've been in my whole life, mm-hmm. control is a big thing that I want to be yeah. like Jesus who said, Here, here's, here's a great example of Jesus that we could model in the church. Everybody's heard the story of the rich young ruler, mm-hmm. very wealthy man, comes up to Jesus. I followed all of the commandments, but what do I have to do to be perfect? And one of the gospels says something just fascinating. It says Jesus loved him. Mm-hmm. There was a personal affinity. Jesus really liked this, whatever, his heart. Jesus was so pleased with him. And so Jesus said, okay, well, here's what you got to do. If you want to be perfect, because you asked me, sell everything you have, give it to the poor and come follow me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the astonishing part of that passage is that is the only time other than the 12 disciples that Jesus gave that invitation to an individual. Hmm. He spoke generally about crowds following him. But when he's talking to that individual, he was inviting him to be in his most intimate circle. Hmm. And we know he had affinity for him. But the rich young ruler, we're told, went away very sad because he was very rich. I, mm. I love the way the Bible words that because you <laughs> yeah. think rich people are very happy. But, um, but what that told me is Jesus didn't let his personal feelings cause him to be t- – he let the person walk away. He turned to his disciples and said, let me explain to you why it's difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Mm. So Jesus wasn't controlling with the person he really cared about. He just said, here's the truth. You follow it or not. If you don't, I'm just going to put my focus on those who want to obey, on those who want to follow. And it's a tough lesson because when we see somebody destroying their life, Mm. we want to control them. Mm. And and I think often it's not because of it's a toxic situation. A mom trying to control a daughter getting into drugs, Mm. she's not toxic. Yeah. But control can become toxic. And if you talk to any mom in that situation, control doesn't work. Mm-hmm. If, if a church tries to control exactly what you said happens, people break out. They mm-hmm. say, yeah. no way. It's not going to happen. Um, and, and so it's not just speaking God's message. It's using God's method. Yeah. And God's method is speak truth, try to persuade, but let people face the consequences. Don't use control. Mm, so good. That's really good. What um what would you say is the way for us to walk away? I, I mean, we're gonna read the book. Trust me. Oh, I've read it. We're reading the book. We are all <laughs> buying the book. But how can we walk away in a healthy way? Um, I think that's probably what keeps us from walking away. It feels hard. It's it feels mm-hmm. like we're gonna hurt someone's feelings, or Sorry. maybe we're afraid of them lashing out, you know? Mm-hmm. So how yeah. do we actually make a break? In a healthy way, in the way Jesus would. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think one of the best, I mean, it, it really depends on the different situation. If somebody's needy, it's different. If somebody's threatening, if somebody's abusive. And, and let me just say, because we never know who's watching. If a woman is in an abusive marriage yeah. that she knows she needs to walk away, she needs to get counsel for a safe separation. Yes. Yeah. Because walking away from abuse can put you in more danger. More danger. Abuse can increase. So. 
please don't just listen to some bald guy on TV and go. go. <laughs> you need to get good counsel with somebody that can help you affect a safe separation. But um, in general, I think it depends on the situation. For instance, I've worked with some couples where they had some really toxic parents. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't just they were being overly sensitive. It was really a situation where um, his wife just felt it took her months to recover. Yeah. And, and one Christmas she said, I just can't go there again. And I said to him, because he said, how do I honor my parents? I said, you honor your parents by treating them as if they're healthy. Mm-hmm. It, it, if my son with our one granddaughter <laughs> were to come up to me and say, dad, we'd love to spend Christmas with you this year, but just for the family's sake, it's just not a healthy thing for us to do. I hope I would respond. I'm, I'm proud of you, Graham. This yeah. is how I raised you to put your family first. Of course, we're going to miss you. Mm-hmm. But if I'm only looking at it, I want you to sacrifice your family for me, then that's that's yeah. not a healthy thing. But let me just say, and I don't have a family member who's toxic, but if I and my parents are wonderful. So if I'm going to go visit my parents and I had a toxic brother-in-law or brother or whatnot, I wouldn't want to keep my kids from seeing their grandparents. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't walk away by not going there. I would go there. And as soon as a toxic person started acting toxic, I would walk away into the next room mm-hmm. or the backyard and find a nephew or niece. I could say, hey, how are things going? Or, or, or you know, an older person, I could say, you know, tell me about your memories of this or that. I would just try to find a healthy conversation uh, and, and not make a scene. I think often it's that you, you just walk away and say, you know what, I'm not going to engage mm-hmm. with this toxic yeah. stuff. Uh, I think if it's a toxic office environment uh, and you know it's going to go on, work overtime to find a way to get out because it it's affecting your sleep. It's probably affecting your eating. It's affecting your mental health. It's affecting your other relationships. In fact, yeah. what I really like to tell the most sensitive of viewers, because I've seen this time and again, that let guilt keep them in a toxic environment. Mm-hmm. You're not just hurting yourself your friends and family that love you hate to see what's happening to you. Yeah. And when you are able to remove yourself from a situation where you're being treated in a toxic way, you will bring them so much joy and happiness. And I get, I love you for being so sensitive that you're worried about hurting one person's feeling, the toxic person. Mm-hmm. But by not wanting to hurt the toxic person, you're causing grief for a mm. dozen people love you that see what's happening and they don't want that for you. That's a really good point. And you know, what I see is those sensitive people that you're talking about, they're usually the ones that want to fix it Mm. and that will stay longer than they should because they want to fix it. And like, how, how can we check our hearts, you know, in those situations? Like (laughs) that that was me. All right. You're you're describing, (laughs) and I would feel guilty if I couldn't fix it. Okay. Um, because I, I always focused on playing spiritual offense. If I'm operating out of love, walking in obedience, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, applying scripture appropriately, that everybody would end up agreeing and, and coming to the Lord. And then I realized that didn't happen for Jesus. It didn't happen for Paul. It didn't happen for Peter. It didn't happen for John. I mean, I, I could go on, but I think I've made the point. Mm. I had this hyper false Messiah expectations. Mm. And when I realized that people have resisted God's truth and healthy advice from the, the perfect person speaking at Jesus himself, it set me free to mm. say, again, not to be controlling, I can present the truth. If you want to receive it, Let's spend more time together. If you want to walk away, I'm going to let you walk away. If you get cantankerous, mm-hmm. I'm going to walk away uh, and and be okay with that. It's not a failure. It's it's really what Jesus calls us to do. There's a famous verse, Matthew 7, 6, that seems whacked out to some, but mm-hmm. it's in the Bible. <laughs> Jesus says, don't give what is holy to dogs or cast your pearl before swine mm-hmm. or else they'll turn and tear you to pieces. Mm. And, and Jesus is saying that to protect his people. If you think Christianity is about being the nicest person in the yeah. room, mm-hmm. you won't be able to believe that Jesus said that. That, mm-hmm. that can't really be in there. And if you think Christianity is about being effective, 
in sharing the truth, inviting people to have an interaction with God. And then if they don't receive it going forward, it's gold. Jesus is saying, look, I don't want you to be torn up. I'm sending you out there. I want you to freely share. But if somebody's destroying you, steer yourself around them. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I just give myself hope that number one, maybe somebody else can interact and I, I'm not the only one that can reach everyone. Mm -hmm. Maybe they need some life events where God chastens them and their heart is opened up mm -hmm. and then they get conviction. And then we can talk because walking away doesn't always mean writing off. Yeah. It just means in this season, you and I interacting isn't helping anybody. Mm -hmm. Let's just admit it and pursue healthy relationships. A lot of our relationships are complicated, but also intertwined. We have friendships with one person who may be toxic, but maybe the, the rest of that group on the fringes is not so much toxic, but this one person is just infiltrating the entire group. So if we make a break from one person, maybe we feel we have to make a break from the whole crew, or how do we do that without like gossiping and saying to yeah. our other friends, this is why mm -hmm. I'm removing myself or, you know, and, and more importantly, what is at stake for us if we're not willing to do that? Yeah. Yes. That's a fantastic question. I'm so glad you gave it. A friend of mine has the best definition of gossip I've ever heard. Gossip is talking negatively about someone to someone else who isn't part of the solution. Okay. If you're talking negative, just to talk negative, that's what's gossip. But in that environment, here's what I think. Not only you should, I think you're obligated to do to go to that person first mm -hmm. and just say, I think you're being controlling or whatever you think the issue is. Very likely if they're toxic, they're not going to receive it. Mm -hmm. then you go to the person who's in charge of the group, not to negative, because the person probably knows it, just says, you know what, I think we're going to lose other members. This is not healthy. We want this to be a safe place. This is a threatening person. Mm -hmm. um, and then the leader has a chance to address it. That's not gossip. You're trying to save mm -hmm. the other people in that group. You're trying to preserve the health of a mm, small group, which is a godly aim. Now, if the leader won't take action, then it might be a time for you to walk away from the group. Mm. But I, I would hope you would stay, address the toxic person first, then go to the leader second uh, and, and, and try to bring life to the yeah. group. I mean, that toxic person is trying to bring death. Mm -hmm. so how do I bring life? And the reality is, if there are eight people with one toxic person, it's much better to remove the one toxic person yeah. than to let the one toxic person destroy a life-giving group to eight people. Absolutely. And, and, and that's where as Christians we get it turned around. Well, no, I don't want to be mean to this toxic yeah. person. But, yeah. but that allows eight people to lose a positive experience one hour a week. Oh, wow. So good. Yeah. So good. So like, good. I could talk. All day long. Forever. We ask all of our guests um, one final question. Where are you personally finding hope these days? My hope is that as individuals or as a nation or as a church, whenever mm. we turn to God, as much as we have hurt him and sinned against him or ignored him or compromised against him, he always takes us back mm -hmm. and he'll yeah. take us back. He'll take us back as individuals as a church, yeah. as a country, if we'll just go back to him. He, he's an amazingly patient and merciful God. Yeah. Mm. Thanks for joining us today on Hope Unabridged. We'd like to remind you, if you're watching us on Good Life 45, you can also listen to these episodes everywhere you listen to podcasts. If you're listening and you would like to see the filmed version of this show or any of our other shows, check us out on Good Life 45 or on our YouTube channel and our app. We hope that something you've heard today really blessed you and we would love for you to share this show with those you love. Just hit that share button on your podcast app or on YouTube and send it to a friend. Please also leave us a review if you feel so inclined. With this program, we are finding hope in the unedited stories of our lives, and we want you to do the same. <laughs>